I will be forever the myth. You're the king of kings, <laughs> There's always a pecking order. The little peckers never mess with the big peckers. So I'm a rooster, and he's a chicken, so to speak. All right, welcome back to the Bodybuilding Legends podcast. I have a very special guest with me this week, my friend Wayne Galash, uh, calling in from Australia. And uh, Wayne is uh, legendary in the sport of bodybuilding because he has been filming the icons of the sport all the way back into the 1970s. So, Wayne, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back. Yeah, we haven't talked in a couple of years, so... It's, it's good to talk to you again. Good to reach out to you. Now, Wayne, uh, you, you're usually at the Mr. Olympia every year, um, but with all this COVID stuff that's been going on the last couple of years, you, you haven't been able to get out there, right? That's correct. Um, unfortunately, COVID stopped my international travel. And the last trip uh, was when I saw you at the 2020 Arnold in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah. And then I haven't been back since then. But I have to get back to the olympia this year yeah okay that's good i'll, I'll see you out there i'll be out there in vegas too in december yeah that'd yeah. be good it'd be like old old times back in las vegas again yeah 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 it's kind of weird they're holding it december but i think they just gotta i, I guess the hotel is supposed to be really beautiful so uh, uh or the uh not the hotel but the uh, the theater where they're holding it at i think it's supposed to be really really nice yeah. they were supposed to do it there uh, two years ago but then that's when the COVID thing came yes. in. So then they had to relocate to Orlando and then they've been out there the last couple of years. That's right. Yeah. Well, uh, Wayne, listen, I, I, I'd like to start off just by um, giving our listeners a little bit of your, your history. So um, those that don't know, Wayne has been filming uh, bodybuilding competitions and bodybuilding competitors uh, all the way back into the 1970s, he filmed the uh, 1970 Naba Mr. Universe in London, England, which was Arnold Schwarzenegger's last uh, Naba Universe win. And back then, they didn't even allow people to film the contest, if you can believe it or not. So uh, Wayne snuck in with his uh, camera in his lunch bag <laughs> and was able to film the contest when the people, when the officials weren't looking. So uh, that, that was the first major show, yeah. right, Wayne, that you covered, the first big one? That was the first major show. And let me tell you why they didn't allow cameras in there. Um, apparently the year before, or maybe two years before, that it, they had allowed the press to come in with video cameras. Okay. And then the press did a report that completely ridiculed the, uh, the universe and uh. Uh, it made fun of the bodybuilders. So after that, the uh, the promoter, the boss of Nabber, Oscar Heidenstam, said, "That's it, no cameras. Uh, they only they are a, a negative effect on our event." So yeah. after I did the 1970 uh, filming, and I said to uh, Oscar that I had done it, he said, "Well, in a way, I'm pleased that you did it because you you preserved history that otherwise would have been lost. And how would you like to do it for us every year from now on?" Wow! Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, and that, that is really the big thing is that you are really a part of bodybuilding history because you were the only one that was around back then who was filming these guys. Yeah. And um, in, in the subsequent yeah. years, I mean, you filmed Frank Zane in 1972. You filmed Arnold and Franco at a pool in Australia when they were in, in town to do a guest posing. Um, you, you filmed a lot of these Napa Mr. Universe contests that had some of the legends of the sport there. And if you wouldn't have done that, we would only have photographs. We never would have saw like video of these guys at all. Yes. Well, let's mention the really, really important one. 1971, Bill Pearl versus Sergio. How about that one? Yeah. How about it? That was, that was a spectacular, it was a head to head battle of absolute champions. Yeah. And so many people, the, a lot of people who weren't at the contest said, ah, oh, they just gave it to Bill Pearl because uh, he was a never legend. <clears throat> but in fact, as Sergio was carrying a bit of fluid, he hadn't arrived early enough before the contest so that on the day he looked fluidy, 
And Bill Pearl looked sharp and vascular. And so the result on the day was the correct one. And then a week later, Sergio looked absolutely fantastic in Paris when he guest posted the Olympia. Yeah, yeah. And so I should mention, you've got all of these films on film. I mean, now, when I was like uh, a teenager or 20 years old, I used to buy your, uh, they were actually films. They were um, uh, yeah. eight mil, were they eight millimeter films? Is that what it was for me? Yes, they, they were Super 8 films. And, super 8 uh, films, yeah. And I... Uh, Right. I saw them up until the end of 82, and then in 83, I changed over to selling on VHS video. Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, I actually had to put these on a projector in my house <laughs> with a screen. I mean, this is how far we're going back, and that's the only way I could see those, but I bought I bought quite a few of your. I remember I bought the one that where Arnold was like 20 years old in 1967, and he was posing in that garden, and, and yeah. it, that was amazing. That was that was probably the first outdoor film that was ever made of Arnold, and that was shot in Wag Bennett's garden in London. Now, did you shoot that, Wayne? Uh, I didn't shoot that. Uh, Tony Gambin shot it and shared it with me. Uh, Tony <clears throat> was an Australian Maltese bodybuilder, and okay. uh, he was he was in London at the time, and then he kindly shared that with me. Then later he went back to live in uh, Malta where he passed away a couple of years ago. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. So was that, that was 67, right? That was the year that Arnold won the universe. I believe it was that year. Yeah. 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 We're going back. A, we're going back a long way there. Yeah. Right. I know. <laughs> but I remember like being a kid and that, that movie was so inspiring to me. I'd watch it over and over again. Cause I was around the same age. And of course I wanted to look like Arnold. So that was, uh, a great motivation to see that over and over again, you know. Yeah, no, it, it, it's one of my favorite early movies, and it's a, it's a bit of a classic now, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So you went from uh, the uh, Super Eight mil Super Eight millimeter uh, vi uh, movies, and then you went to VHS yeah. tapes, and then you went to DVDs, and now you're selling everything by downloads on your on your website. Yeah. That's right, yes. We've been selling by download. Our first download was uh, 10 years and about three months ago. Oh, and really? Then, uh, yeah, so it's, it's over 10 years. <clears throat> and um, everything that was always available on DVD still is because there are some people out there that still like what's called a bit of an old-fashioned hard copy, something they can put on their shelf, just get it out anytime, pop it in their DVD player. So there are still people out there uh, buying DVDs every week, virtually every day. And, of course, the majority of people do the downloads because yeah. it's quicker and faster and you have instant gratification with the download. Yeah. And it's a little bit cheaper too, right? right, right? Uh, yes. It's a, bit, it's a bit cheap. That's right. Because you're not buying a hard copy and saving on postage. Right. Right. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about, about your background, Wayne. When did you get involved with lifting weights? And when, when did you start? When was your interest in bodybuilding? When did that start? Well, I started lifting weights in uh, well, when I was 21. Okay. And uh, the, reason, the reason I started lifting was that I was playing squash and I was right on the edge of the top grade for squash competition. Okay. And one of, the, uh, one of the more local legends of the sport said, I think you'd be even better if you did a bit of strength training. So I thought, well, hell, what's strength training? So I went to a gym and I started to do training that would assist my sport of squash. And then I soon found that people at the gym were encouraging me to, to go in a gym competition. And so that's where it started. So I went in one at the gym and I was uh, successful there. And then I thought, oh, look, I'll keep moving up the, the level of the uh, contest. And so that's how it, it went. And gradually, uh, the sport of squash receded a bit into the background, although I did compete at both of them, uh, squash and uh, gym sports, which was bodybuilding and powerlifting. So that all started a, a very long time ago. And mm -hmm. then from that, I started to photograph uh, people in the gym. 
Uh, they asked me to do photos. They knew I liked photography. And out of that, I got the idea to film the Navi Universe in 1970 <clears throat> because I was going to go to London for a, for a trip to, uh, to drive around in England and Europe. And so that's how that started. And then it just kept going from, from that point. Okay. So did you call up the organizers of the Nava Universe and ask if you could film that contest? Well, <clears throat> not, <clears throat> not exactly. <clears throat> I went into their office and I bought my tickets. Okay. And I just, I just kept quiet that I was going to film this 1970 Olympia. Because I thought, well, if I don't try, uh, I won't ever die wondering what if I'd done it. So I had to go to, I did it. Um, luckily, the people in there that were watching for cameras in the audience didn't see me. And then, as I said, from uh, 1971 onwards, I was most welcome. And uh, Oscar said, uh, you can keep doing this for us as our historian for as long as you wish. So then that continued on right up until the year 2010 when it mm. came to an end because they gave the job to a local company in England that was prepared to do all of the regional shows as well as the universe and then sadly for me that was the end of my never universe videotaping career wow so you did it from 1970 to 2000 and what you say 2001 and 2000 oh, 10 2010 okay. yeah that's about 40 years. 40 years, yeah. Unbelievable. Wow. And you, you got every year. You record yeah. every year. Every year. I loved doing it. People might say, why did you bother? Why did you go so far and spend all that money on the airfares? Yeah. Well, I just love, love doing it. I mean, I look at it this way, that my life has been having the dream job. Do you think this was your dream job, what you're doing now, Wayne? Absolutely. Yes, it is, because not only do you see the best contests, the best bodybuilders in the world, yeah, you combine it with travel, which I also love. I love to yeah. travel to the different countries, because when you do a world championships, for example, with NABA, that was in a different country and usually a different continent each year. Yeah. So that, that, that took me to some places from South Africa to South Africa to Europe and of course Australia so yeah. it's it's a dream job doing what you love and combining it with travel yeah yeah so how has that worked out like financially Wayne because I can imagine you know sometimes when we pursue our passions it doesn't really pay off uh, financially but um, you know you've been doing this now for so many years since 1970 so how has that worked out? Has it been a struggle to try to make money from this? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, look, I look at it this way. If I break even with a contest, particularly a contest where I've had to travel, yeah. then that is a victory. Because so many contests I do just for the love of it, where you don't make money, it costs you to be there, and uh, you do it anyway because you don't do it because of the money. You do it because you love recording the history and then sharing it with people that it makes them so happy years after the event they can buy a contest in which they they appeared so the money side of it is modest very modest um here's an interesting fact for you uh my travel agent who i've been with for 40 years he mm. worked out how much money i would have spent going to contests for airfares and hotels, and you're going to be staggered at the figure. Wow. It was over a million. Wow. Over Seriously? One, yeah, that's serious. That's over 52 years. Now, yeah. that's where the money went. And people think that I get rich because I have all these contests, but I'm rich in spirit, but not in money because it costs you so much to be there. Yeah. And then after you come home, You've got to do post production. You've got to prepare it. Yeah. Ready for sale. It doesn't, you know, it's not automatic that it's just suddenly available. Yeah. So I'm glad you asked me that. Most people don't know the background of what goes on before we get some wonderful video of a contest that took place, say, for example, in South Africa or some other unusual place where it cost me a lot of money to be there. Yeah. So how do you think? Um, 
like, how are you doing now with your sales and stuff, Wayne? Because, you know, like when I talk to some of these younger people in bodybuilding today, even a lot of the competitors, even the pro bodybuilders, I'm amazed at how many of them don't know the history of the sport. They don't know a lot of the champions that went before. Um, you know, if we go back, I mean, Lee Haney won the Mr. Olympia in 1984. So, I mean, that's like 30 years ago already, right? And then, you know, Arnold is like 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So, I mean, it, it is going back now because we're in the year 2022. So, I mean, time has gone by. So, I mean, are people still interested in buying these old contests? Are they still interested in the history of the sport? Well, the great news is, yes, they are, but it's a certain hardcore group of, of fans who love the old contests. And this will also surprise you. Some of the most popular old contests are ones from Germany and Europe. People just love those contests. Hmm. I'm not sure why, but they would be the most popular older group of uh, downloads or DVDs uh, from the 80s, 90s, uh, from the German area of Europe. And they just incredible universal appeal they just go on and on and on people want them but a lot of people younger people in bodybuilding they don't even know who Grimmick and Bill Pearl were for example those sort of names unfortunately are being lost on the younger people because they just don't hear about them these days right right yeah I, I mean everybody calls me the historian because I remember a lot of this stuff now but you know I'm I'm kind of young, I guess, to be called a historian, but now uh, we lost our friend Peter McGuff, and, you know, he was around before I was, so he remembered a lot of these old stories and stuff, and I guess uh, just yeah. most people just don't keep up with the history of the sport, so that, that's, I was, that's why I was yeah. wondering if people are still interested in watching these old competitions. Well, there are a few people. Let's say it might be 10% of fans, and uh, that percentage stays pretty constant mm -hmm. and these fans are the people that know who reg park was whereas a lot of young bodybuilders today wouldn't even know who reg park was but when i started training he was the greatest in the world along with bill pearl and then right. soon after that then Uncle came along yeah. so how many of the young today know that that history i'd say not many no not many so do you have just like a real loyal fan base that is buying more and more of their stuff and, and they, they keep adding to their collection? Yes, that's exactly what it is. That's what, that's what pays the bills and keeps me going and keeps us going. Uh, we do have uh, the majority of our customers are regular fans that buy over and over. And, and some of them right back to buying on film like you used to. I've got a customer in in Malta that used to buy my old Super 8 films. So some of them go back like that for 50 years that they've been supporting that well, what I have to offer. And, of course, we do pick up new younger fans, and they are often mostly interested in the latest current type of contest, the Arnold Classic or the Olympia or something like that. Yeah. It's a mix of people that love the classic older, older guys and those fans just are so loyal and they go on forever. Yeah. Is there any particular era that's the most popular way? Is it like the 60s, the 70s? Or I know the 90s is really popular with a, a lot of younger fans yeah. today because a lot of people consider that the best decade in bodybuilding as far as the bodybuilders. Well, that's easy to answer. The, the 80s, 90s are the most popular. Okay. It is the most popular period. Yeah, the 80s, 90s. Perhaps going back from the, the time of Arnold winning the 1980 Olympia, but more so the mid-1980s and all through the 90s. Okay. And that's when they used to have, in the 90s, they had pro Grand Prix all throughout Europe. Do you remember yeah. those days? It was the French oh, yeah. Grand Prix, yeah. the, Russian, the German Grand Prix, the Spanish, the English Grand Prix. Yeah. But those days are gone. That's, that's all over now, which is yeah. a bit sad. Yeah, yeah, it is. And they, they had some great bodybuilders competing in that era because you had, like, Kevin Lavroni, Vince Taylor, um, yes. Sean Ray didn't go, but, like, uh, Lee Labrada, um, Dorian Yates, of course. You had Paul Dillette, you had Chris Cormier. So you had some really, really – and Nasser El Sambadi, some really great bodybuilders. 
And also towards the end of that period, you had Lee Priest doing the Grand Prix all over yeah. the place. Yeah. That was in the, towards the end of the period. But earlier on, you had McAwee and, and oh, yeah. uh, Labrada, as you said. And, uh, and uh, Kevin Lebroni won a lot of Grand Prix, so, and Vince yeah. Taylor. So they were the, what I call the, the magical years. Yeah, yeah. So what, what keeps you motivated to keep going, Wayne, after all these years? I mean, it's been decades and decades and decades, and, you know, it's not like uh, you're a multimillionaire from this. I mean, this is obviously a passion project. What keeps you going to do it? Well, I think it is that, that, as you said, it's a passion project. Yeah. Um, I do it because I enjoy each contest that I'm, I'm videotaping. I'm enjoying the contest as a fan, and mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it technically so as to not screw up. And the other thing I'm doing, I can't help but be judging at the same time in my head. I'm judging who do I think is the best, who's going to win this. Um, and then I'm comparing my mental judging with the actual results when it comes out. So I never get bored. Every contest, to me, is a new, exciting experience. And uh, that's how I keep going. I never think of it. It's not work. It's just yeah. following your passion. I just I enjoy it when the results are given out because it's always exciting and it's always different because you don't have the same people in the same contest in a consecutive way. Everyone is a, is a new experience. So I guess it's a combination of that, enjoying the actual drama of being there, and also I like the travel to have to get there. Yeah, yeah. I, I can relate to that. I'm the same as you. I mean, I've been involved in bodybuilding since the late 70s, so it's been a long, long period for me too. And I still get excited. You know, I still get excited at the contest. And I, I guess more than anything, I'm, I'm just a fan. I'm just a big bodybuilding fan, you know. You should tell the story about how I asked you to do some uh, interviews for me at the Olympia. And I don't think you'd done many video interviews. And then sometimes we'd come up to a person that you didn't know hardly anything about. And I, I might have known them from, say, Europe. And yeah. I'd give you a few tips on fast. And do you remember those years? Yeah, yeah, at the Olympia. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because yeah, I think um, Ken, Kenny Castle was the one doing uh, the interviews before, right? And then... Kenny passed yeah, away, yeah. and I, I reached out to you, and I asked you if you needed anybody to help with the interviews. Yeah, that's exactly right. You took over from uh, poor old Kenny, who he was a fantastic interviewer because he was so passionate. Yeah, you remember how he used to get? He was so excited when he did an interview, <laughs> and uh, and he had this. He had a big, deep, booming voice. There's never another person like Kenny Castle, and. Uh, I, I treasured the times and, and the years that I spent with him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't I think I ever really got to know Kenny that much. Um, but I always remember him at all the contests. He was backstage expediting at a lot of the Olympias. And then, you know, I saw him doing the interviews for you too, you know. That's right. Yeah, I stayed with Kenny in 2006 for a couple of weeks. And that was one of the best periods of my life uh, the things that we did and the chats that we had, it was absolutely incredible. Really? Where did he live? Uh, he lived in New Jersey, uh, just across the border from uh, New York State. Uh, he lived in a tiny little town. I just forget the name of it. But it was very handy to uh, New York City. And so we would be going there all the time for different things, gym, entertainment. Uh, there was the 2006 Night of uh, Champions. And that's the, the main reason why I was there in 2006. And as you know, uh, Lee Priest won that contest. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, and that, that was Lee's last victory in the USA. Yeah, yeah. You see how Lee looks now? He's making, kind of making a comeback. He looks really good. He's dieting. Yes, I saw the pictures of him with John Bailey uh, receiving an award at Muscle Beach the yeah. other, oh, a couple of weeks ago. And I thought he looked pretty big. His yeah. arms were huge. Yeah, his arms are still huge. I know. Hey, Wayne, tell me a little bit about the editing process that goes in. Because I know, like, with, uh, with the videos that I do on YouTube, when I interview somebody, I'll, I'll edit. I'll put, like, pictures and video clips and stuff. And I don't think people understand how drawn out of a job that is. I mean, sometimes I'll work for 12 hours 
on a one hour interview. So I can imagine when you're at these contests yeah. and you're filming all this footage, hours and hours and hours of footage, it's got to really be a job when you get back home and you got to edit it all, right? Yes, well, that's right. What happens is this. I do the basic edit when I get back. In other words, that means leaving out all the bits that I don't want, tightening it up, yeah. uh, working it out to, into, for example, when you have a very long content, you can't offer a very long download because it's too difficult to download. So then I work out the cut points that it might be offered in three parts as a download, one, two, three. Okay. Uh, and each part might be, it could be, for example, between 60 to 90 minutes long. So when I've done all the, the preliminary work, I then hand it over to our, our technical expert editor, and that's Ollie Park. And then Ollie does the fine tuning. Uh, he adds things, titles, uh, prepares it for the, uh, the download, and, uh, and also does the authoring for the DVD copy if we, if we think it's worthy of uh, putting out in the DVD. So he does all the fine tuning that is the final stages. And, uh, and it always takes him and takes us longer than you expect it to. And as you said, 12 hours, it's, that can easily be eaten up just doing one project. <laughs> I know, it's unbelievable. Now, the, the contests have really changed a lot, Wayne, since the old days when they just had bodybuilding. So now they've got all these different divisions. And if you go to the Arnold or you go to the Olympia, uh, if you're going to be in the, in the expo or, or filming the prejudging or wherever it's at, I mean, you're going to be there for hours. Does it, do you ever get tired or, or you know, wiped out from doing all, those, all that footage? Um, yeah, well, yes, I do. And so in the more recent years, talking about the last, say, five years, I've always made sure I've got a reserve cameraman with me so okay. that if you, if, you start, if you happen to feel poorly, I remember one year I started to feel dizzy because it had gone on so long. And wow. so I went and got some food. And uh, that was during an amateur Olympia in Las Vegas. And so my, my uh, deputy cameraman took over and he was fine. I went and got some food. I walked around the casino. And I came back, and then I was fine, pissed it off. Yeah. But the worst, con the worst contest I ever did was in Europe, in Austria. And uh, it started late in the day, and it didn't finish until after 4.30 a.m. the following morning. Oh, uh, crazy. That really? Was, yeah, wow. yeah, that is the absolute truth. So I walked back to the hotel after the contest with my equipment, and I got into the hotel at 5 o'clock. Oh my and the God. hotel manager, the manager said, well, we're not quite ready to serve breakfast. And I said, that's okay. I'm not here for breakfast. I'm here. I've just come home. I'm going to bed. So <laughs> that was the worst. And uh, that was the toughest contest ever uh, yeah. that I can remember. Because it started late in the afternoon. and It had probably 250 competitors and it just oh dragged God. on and on and on. So that was that was going back about fifteen years. But generally speaking, uh, I get through the contest these days without any trouble at all. Uh, I'm pleased to say. Wow! Now a lot of people may not know this, but you were also a judge, right, at the Napa Universe for many years. Yes, I I did judge there from between 1972 up until 1986, and I didn't judge every year but I judged whenever they asked me. Uh, and the very first year, 1972, that was the year when uh, Frank Zane won. Yeah. So that was, uh, that was an awesome experience. And at the end of the judging, they, they used to rate the judges to see who was the most accurate judge. Now, you never hear that happening these days, do you? No. They, they just don't do that. Because right. The judges. The judges' identities these days aren't generally revealed next right. to the markings or placement. But back right. then, you were, not, you were named what, who you voted for, where, the, where you placed them, and that would be in the magazines, hmm. Health right. and Strength magazine. And I, I, uh, my, my one hope was that I was not going to be the worst judge. <laughs> so anyway, they rated, they rated all the judges as to how accurate the, their marks were to the final results. And so I do remember that I came in in second place, and I was pretty happy with that. Wow. I felt that I, I hadn't screwed. 
And so then in 1986, when I judged, uh, and that's when Charlie Claremont won, he won the Amity Universe. Yeah. And it, this meant that because I was shooting video in from 1983 onwards, I had to have somebody else film the pre-judging because you can't be doing video and judging. Yeah. So after that, I decided that my judging would be over because I wanted to shoot the Navi Universe pre-judging myself from, from that year on, which is what I did. And so I haven't judged officially since then. But I, when I'm at a contest, I'm unofficially judging, like I said, because I love to see if my thoughts are going to be similar to those of the judges with their final results. Yeah. And I guess you must do that sometimes, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was judging also myself uh, back in the 80s in Chicago. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a hard job to judge. It's not as easy as, uh, as a lot of people think, you know. Yes, because you don't want to let anybody down because you could be making an influence on their career. And yeah. you don't want to be, you don't want to make a bad decision that might hurt somebody badly. So, yeah. oh, yes, it's a very, it's a responsible job. Yeah, especially with uh, the NABA universe. I didn't realize you were doing it in those years. I mean, those are really some iconic years from 72 to 86. I mean, you really saw some legends of the sport. Of course, you missed Arnold. His last one was uh, 70. Yeah. But, I mean, you saw Frank yeah. Payne. You saw Chris Dickerson, Boyer Co. Um, and then you yeah. saw um, Serge Nubre, right? Bertle Fox, uh, yeah. Dave Johns, yes, Tony yeah. Evan, all those guys too, right? Yeah, and there was an American guy called Ron Thompson. Do you remember that name? Sure, yeah, 1974, I think he was, Mr. America. Because I remember him very well at the universe. I thought that he should have won his class, but he didn't. So things like that stick in mind. You just never forget. Yeah. Do you remember the one where um, Serge Nubre got second? Did he get second to Tony Emmett in 1977? Um, he got second to, uh, I think it was Bertil Fox, wasn't it? It was, it was one of those years. He was yeah. beaten by Bertil Fox in the pro. And then afterwards, he, he, he claimed to Oscar Heidenstam that it was rigged against him because all of the British crowd was screaming for Bertil. I think you're referring to that. Okay. And he all felt right. that he, he hadn't been judged fairly, fairly because the audience influenced the judges. And he asked Oscar Heidenstam to reverse the decision and place him first. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Oh, he actually asked Oscar to reverse the decision. <laughs> wow. He asked, he, asked, he asked him, would he reverse the, the, the decision because he said it was unfair. Jeez, unbelievable. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so let me ask you a couple of questions. No, about that would, Go ahead. Wayne. That wouldn't happen. I was going to say that was a once only thing. I've never seen anything like that in all my years of bodybuilding. Yeah. Uh, particular, simply incredible. Yeah. Well, now that you brought that up, let me ask you a couple, uh, let me bring up a couple names from those years and just get your thoughts on it. Uh, we'll start with 1972 with Frank Zane, um, who that had to be one of his best shapes ever. So what did you think of Zane when he was on stage? Uh, well, I thought this, as soon as he walked on stage, I, I knew he had won it. Yeah. It was clear because he had the perfect combination of symmetry, the right degree of definition. Although he wasn't huge, he, he looked quite, quite big because he had these small joints. So he had a, a, a package that was clearly the winner. And uh, from then on, it was a matter of who's going to be second, third, fourth. Yeah, so that one was a pretty, that was an easy uh, decision when he won in that particular year. Uh, I think 72 was the best that Zane ever looked at. at Nava, but then he continued on competing up until, what, 83? Uh, um, yeah, 83. And he did. Was last year, yeah. Yeah, he had a slightly different look as he got older. Yeah. Maybe it was even more, he was even more defined. Yes. Uh, but the other, thing, the other thing that stood out in 1972, because I filmed him in a park on the day that we went to the Nabba Universe finals. It used to be an afternoon show for yeah. the finals, and they would judge it the day before. 
So we, uh, we did this filming in the park, and I said to Frank, look, a roll of Super 8 film runs for about three and a half minutes. Um, how are you going to go for doing the posing routine? He said, don't worry. We'll pose continuously for three and a half minutes, and I'll completely fill your film. And that's exactly what he did. Wow. So he posed for three and a half minutes. Yeah. With, without any, any break, any clear duplication of poses, it was just fluid from beginning to end, three and a half minutes of wow. pure pose and mastery. He was, he was a master poser. Yeah, he was. Tell me that story about when you guys went. Into so the that, park. Wasn't the park like locked or something and you had to find your way to get in there? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. It was a private little park uh, in Hyde Park Square, which is very central in London. Okay. And it had a low fence around it, a gate. And the uh, guy that was helping me who had a, had a house uh, on the square didn't have a key to the gate. So uh, we just jumped over the gate and went into this little park and did our filming. Yeah. And there was no problem. Nobody came complained. Uh, it was just sort of the, the, the way things were back then. Things were pretty easy going. Yeah. And it was a perfect, a perfect background. It was lawn and trees and buildings in the background. You can probably remember the background of yeah, the I apartments do, yeah. and, and trees and stuff. It was a lovely background. And I, filmed many bodybuilders in the park, in that park, and some years, so I did have access to a key, so I didn't have to jump over the gate. <laughs> and weren't you guys on your way to the finals when that happened, when you when you start, decided to stop? And <laughs> yeah, yes, that's right. Frank and I, when we finished doing the shoot, we caught a taxi together and we went into the finals and then a couple of hours later, he was announced as a professional Mr. Universe for 1972. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I love hearing uh, stories about people who saw these guys in their peak on stage, you know, like Frank said, because believe it or not, Wayne, I mean, I hear bodybuilders talk today and they'll talk bad about Frank Zane. They'll say, how did this guy ever win Mr. Olympia? He was so skinny. I don't understand it. And they, they weren't there. They don't see they didn't see how great he looked in his time, you know, and, and how he looked yeah. on stage. I, I saw his Mr. Olympia win, so I can attest to how he looked. And you were right there mm. seeing him up close, being a judge in the yeah. contest and, and seeing him. Because, you know, when they did this judging at the Navi Universe, the guys were right there in front. So um, you, you saw yeah, you, and you saw you were, him. Yes, the judging would take place on the Friday and the – and the show for the presentation or finals, as it's now called, that would take place on the Saturday afternoon. And yeah. that's how it, they did it that way for many, many years. And then later on, they transitioned and made it happen all in one day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. Um, let me ask you about Chris Dickerson, because he's another guy that gets picked on by today's bodybuilders. And they're like, I, this, he was the worst Mr. Olympia ever. And, you know, he, he didn't have any biceps. And how did this guy ever win Mr. Olympia? But, again, this is another guy who was a master bodybuilder, uh, a great bodybuilder, and you saw him up close as well. I did. And I, I've been analyzing how and why he won. And when you saw him on stage, he, he just looked like physical perfection uh, from the top to the bottom. Uh, fantastic calves, good symmetry, always good condition, superb yeah. posing. And when he walked on stage, he, he held himself and acted like a winner. So he had that little touch of charisma that made him stand out. And when you think about it, the people that he, he, he uh, beat, back in those days, there were no Dorian Yates or Ronnie Coleman's. Right. So he was the, be he was the best of the best of the type of physique that he had to beat at that time. Right. And so we, should, we shouldn't measure him against people of today because you're talking different eras. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I always make the point that, you know, Dickerson was a champion in the AAU, in NABA, in uh, the yeah. WBBG, and in the IFBB. I mean, if you look at all the titles he won in all those organizations, are you telling me that all these judges didn't know what they were doing? I mean... These were the best judges in the world at the time, national and international judges, and they all put him first place in so many of these competitions. 
the guy obviously was a fantastic bodybuilder. Yeah. Yes, he was. Of course, the modern fans of today just don't fully understand that and never no. saw him at his peak. Right. And he was just a phenomenal bodybuilder. And the only thing that would beat him occasionally would be the size of his arms or his biceps, but everything else was pretty well absolutely perfect. Yeah, yeah, I like the point you made about his symmetry was so perfect, his skin was so perfect. You know, he had those great legs, those incredible calves. Yeah. The way he stood on stage, yeah. he was, you know, his, his uh, definition and his conditioning was always so good. I mean, he was a fantastic bodybuilder. And his posing. So yeah. the way he displayed him, he had a flawless display. And he always, as I said, looked and acted the champion. Yeah. And I hardly ever, I hardly ever saw him defeated. In fact, uh, he he would beat the best of the best at the Nabi Universe. And then, of course, he was runner-up in 1980 at the uh, Olympia. And then I was there when he won the 1982 Olympia in London at Wembley. Yeah, yeah. Did you think he deserved that that year win in '82? I'll put it this way. I had seen him look a little bit better. He was pretty much towards the end of his career when he won in yeah. 1982. It's hard to say that he didn't deserve it, <clears throat> but it was like as if he was winning it because they knew that he deserved to win it because he'd just missed out a couple of times before. So I felt there was a little bit of that in it, a bit of sort of sympathy for him. But he had looked better when he was a, a bit younger, that's for sure. Yeah, okay. What about uh, Boyer Co? Because Boyer was a, a big uh, name in the Navi universe for many years. I think he won the universe four times. Um, so he, this is another great bodybuilder uh, to see in person. Yes, I would have been a judge at least on one of his victories. Uh, Boyer Co, he had these fantastic arms. And he had a sweeping sort of a style on stage. And uh, he had virtually everything except he didn't have a, a, a six pack. Yeah. Uh, I mean, his waist, his waist was small, but that was, of course, his weakest area. If somebody had everything he had and they had a good set of abs, well, then, of course, boy, you would get second. Yeah. But most of the time, people couldn't bat match him in his overall package that he presented. And that was sufficient for him to win all those Navy Universe titles. Yeah. And he was one of those guys who really came alive when he posed. I remember when I saw him at the Olympia, every year I saw him, he was in fantastic shape, but his posing routine was so great. I mean, he just, he, he would get the crowd so excited when he posed because he hit these signature poses that only he could hit. And he knew how to really display his body to the best, you know? Yeah, he did. He had what I call the sweeping posing style and you, you got caught up in it. Because it was an yeah. exciting style to see. Yeah, yeah. 